Well, we're still examining univariate estimation in PDF number 21. And I'm in the page of the PVI, Processing Versus Inversion uh, Overheads, the page that says 123 at the top right. And we had just looked at uh, what are we really doing by doing the smooth division by 0. And uh, we discovered that, uh, in fact, uh, just the uh, either whether it's uh, a water level or a, uh, a smooth division by zero, what we're essentially doing is um, we're, we're having to estimate a parameter epsilon, which is our kind of our, our damping uh, here in this uh, deconvolution by spectral division using a known source wavelet f and deriving the, uh, the input model x, which uh, for a seismic reflection case would be our Earth reflectivity series. And um, you know, in this smooth division by 0, we're, we're required to estimate this epsilon squared. Okay? And if we have a very small epsilon, then we have exactly inverse filtering with the problems that inverse filtering brings, namely you know, trouble where the source wavelet is, uh, has near zero power. That gets blown up in the, in the inverse. And then if we uh, have the capability, if we make epsilon very large, um, such as somewhere around the maximum of f, and this is true whether we use exactly the smooth division by zero or a water level, you know, damping or water level, um, what we essentially have is just match filtering instead of, instead of inverse filtering. So you know, we take our vibrator data y, which have already been correlated by our, um, our uh, vibra size uh, um, sweep uh, to get a uh, vibra size wavelet. And then to, to try to deconvolve it, we, uh, we are just cross-correlating it you know, in the frequency domain, multiplying it by the um, complex conjugate of the source wavelet of the vibrator wavelet in the frequency domain. So uh, you know, we take our correlated vibrator data and we cross-correlate it against the, uh, the source wavelet again. And that is supposed to estimate, that's supposed to accomplish deconvolution and make our, uh, our source wavelet uh, uh, more spiky. Uh, and show us the Earth reflectivity sequence. Um, now, as crazy as this sounds, it's actually a time-honored um, and uh, very effective data processing technique. There's a lot of things like this that uh, make no sense to earthquake seismologists, <clears throat> but um, make uh, uh, but actually work. Okay. Whereas uh, what makes physical sense, you know, according to the physical filtering model uh, is less likely to work. Lots of things like this. That's what led to the whole processing versus inversion book that Claire Bout wrote. And um, uh, in fact, the earthquake seismologists did uh, uh, kind of adopt these techniques when they started looking at uh, microtremor or seismic noise inversion, uh, and seismic noise uh, cross-correlation. Uh, creating uh, empirical Green's functions uh, with just exactly this kind of uh, cross-correlation of, of two you know, already convolved data traces. And that actually turns out to be a deconvolution that gets you the, the Green's function of wave propagation from uh, you know, one station whose trace you're, you're cross-correlating to the other uh, uh, station Who's, uh, uh, that's the other uh, providing the other side of the cross correlation. So um, uh, the earthquake seismologists are even uh, getting on board uh, uh, with this match filtering idea now, uh, even though they don't quite realize it. <clears throat> so um, hey John, at that water level, yeah, would it would it not make more sense to just bulk shift everything up by a constant to preserve the relative 
power a little bit more? Ah, uh, that's the uh, uh, that's that's exactly what uh, is done with the the damping, right? This epsilon squared. That's the shift is epsilon squared. That's the shift up. Okay. So it's a different strategy, and what uh, uh, what this strategy is is that you know down in the uh, uh, with the, the strategy of the water level technique is that down here where the the power of the at these frequencies where the power of the of the source wavelet is small is just noise anyway, and so you 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 know you're better off just wiping it out. Basically erasing it and replacing it with this water level. So kind of that structure on the right side, that's just going to be noise anyway. Uh, very, very likely. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, it depends on your data. Okay. Um, depends on your data acquisition, all of that. Uh, but you're right. The, there, there are two, two reasonable uh, strategies there. So uh, what we've boiled down to now is seeing that the either the water level or the the bulk shift or uh, damped uh, spectral division, the smooth division by zero, uh, which takes uh, our data and um, and divides out the uh, uh, the source wave f and gives us our uh, our input. Um, Sequence before convolution, which is uh, the reflector uh, sequence. Okay, um, now we know what epsilon is. Okay, by considering uh, what the true, um, you know, that we, uh, of course, Clairbout does this by by essentially working backwards. He says, well, what if we uh, set up a uh, an objective function Q here? That it could either find us x or n, okay, the input or the noise, okay, and and what would our uh, then what would our uh, uh, solution be, okay, and um, so we find that it's just the smooth division by zero that we were already talking about, and Clairbaut is very tricky that way. Uh, so now we know what uh, from this we know from that uh, setup of the problem what the uh, you know, uh, minimizing the uh, power of the of the uh, of the input x that we're inverting for, and minimizing for the power of noise. <clears throat> okay, that minimization is telling us that our epsilon is the variance of the noise divided by the variance of the input. <clears throat> so now we know what what epsilon is, and that actually it's determined by the problem. It's determined by the data. <clears throat> we may not have the the freedom to uh, to set it wherever we want. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, and in essence, what we're getting are uh, are two new unknowns, right? Um, you know, we don't we have uh, we can get the variance of the data, no problem. You know, sigma sub y, we could get that, but we really have no idea what the <clears throat> What the variance of x is, right? That's what we're trying to x is what we're trying to invert for. So we don't really know what its variance is. Uh, neither do we really know what the variance of the noise is. Okay. So um, uh, these are more things that we have to get some sort of estimate for. So now back to page one twenty three. Okay, uh, two thirds of the way down through the PDF number twenty one. Um, our, our solution then for the uh, our desired you know reflectivity sequence X contains you know essentially two new unknowns sigma squared n and sigma squared X. So how do we get that? All right. Well, let's use an initial guess for uh, their ratio and get an estimate of X. So that get some X hat. Um, then we use uh, uh, our. Um, <clears throat> We solve our, our our problem for the noise now. We invert for the noise, okay, uh, and we solve it for uh, for an estimate of n, the noise, okay, 
so that should be n hat as well. Uh, and then uh, once we have the uh, x hat, once we have n hat, we can compute uh, sigma squared of, of n and sigma squared of x, okay, and and take their ratio, right? Sigma n squared over sigma x squared. And is that ratio better or different from our initial estimate? Right, we got to use some initial guess. And is it? Uh, are, are we going to be able to find this ratio better? So we have an iterative procedure now. Okay, and Clairbout, of course, tried this out. Uh, I don't remember what data set he tried that on. Um, whether it really was a reflection data set or or whether it was something a little more exotic or simple. Um, so he, he sets a, uh, uh, an initial guess for sigma n over sigma x. And then what he found through iteration is that uh, uh, his, uh, uh, you know, given, given some initial uh, estimate, right, uh, guess for the ratio, the ratio he converged to went to zero. Okay, So he was converging on a ratio, at least for his problem, that said that uh, there was no noise, um, and it was all in the uh, all in the x. And then he tried a different initial guess, and that led to a uh, sigma uh, n over sigma x that converged to one. Okay, remember uh, the implications here. If uh, the ratio is zero, then we have then we're using spectral division to estimate our uh, reflectivity sequence. Uh, if the uh, if it converges to if, if we use one, then we just use uh, match filtering. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, you know, he's not getting any guidance here from this sort of bifurcation, uh, this nonlinear bifurcation of the, uh, of the, of the uh, convergence. So, so what this is saying is that for in linear estimation for that input x, uh, at least in the frequency domain, using this objective function q that minimizes x, that minimizes the, the noise, that objective function is unable to solve the univariate problem of estimating, you know, in, in, in at least this linear, uh, linearized way, iterative linearized way, it can't solve the problem of estimating our epsilon or epsilon squared, sigma n squared over sigma x squared. And, and um, this is an important issue because, you know, how high we raise the water level uh, puts a lot of control on the effect of, of the noise near the spectral holes in the in the known um, in the known source wavelet, <clears throat> and it's crucial to obtaining a, a good estimate. You know, the 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 effect uh, near the of the noise near the spectral holes uh, is really crucial to to getting the appropriate uh, uh, estimate of the input, okay, but you know we're using uh, we're using the wrong apparently we're using the wrong uh, q the wrong um, uh, the wrong objective function and we can't determine uh, we can't determine this. So um, all right, so so uh, the the illustration here of this uh, deconvolution problem is really um, you know, Clairbout comes back later in the book and and uh, you know looks again at the problem of deconvolution and and uh, how to solve it. But uh, this whole exercise is really uh, w what this is pointing out is you know the setup of a uh, of a simple inverse uh, and then uh, you know the pitfalls that you can that you can get. When you um, <clears throat> even try to set up a very simple univariate estimation uh, for something as simple as this epsilon, so um, it's uh, um, uh, it's kind of a lesson in configuring uh, uh, configuring inversion problems, <clears throat> and it's just you know one of one of many possible applications. Okay. So what uh, you know what what this lesson is all about is uh, um, you know are these pitfalls? It's it's not so much you know how exactly are we going to deconvolve uh, for this reflectivity sequence? It's more um, you know 
what advantage can you try to gain uh, with a with a, a univer univariate uh, inversion procedure, uh, and then uh, what problems are you going to run into? And you can imagine those problems will just multiply once you uh, you go away to multivariate uh, estimation. <clears throat> um, hey, John, this is a silly question, but it's Q of x and n, so why is it univariate? Or is that just because we're trying to solve for? Oh, oh, the the um, uh, we're trying to solve for that one epsilon. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah, we could we could you know we're basing the objective function off whatever we want, right? And what seems obvious is to is uh, at least in this first trial was to minimize the you know because the the inversion is likely to blow up near the uh, the spectral holes. Okay, the the spectral division will blow up near the spectral holes. Then the next thing that we usually think of is okay. I'm going to invert to minimize the power of the of the uh, the result of the inversion, uh, which is either x or n. Yeah. You know, so we got we got to have both of them in there because they both play a role in the convolution. Um. But but uh, um, you know that means that uh, that our initial what what this all means is that our initial uh, attempt to uh, to calm the the raging inverse, you know, by by minimizing the power of the input um, and the noise isn't going to work. And, and and all we're trying to do is estimate that epsilon. That's that's it. That's all we were trying to do. So so let's look at uh, uh, some more univariate uh, estimation and. What uh, uh, the topic we're going to get here is is all right. Let's let's invert for just one parameter, but we're going to allow that parameter to vary. So we're still uh, it's still a univariate uh, uh, estimation problem. It's not multivariate, um, but uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna try to construct a whole field of of estimated values. You know, maybe a whole three D or four D volume of these estimated values. So um, the the topic now is non stationarity and moving windows. That's the moving windows is the uh, you know technique used to deal with non stationarity. So let me define a little bit and give you some examples about what what I mean by stationarity and non stationarity. As we saw in um, in seven oh six. Stationarity of a data series means that uh, the data series, the image, the volume, has the same statistical and spectral properties everywhere. You know, spectral properties are really just another kind of statistical property. Uh, so some of these uh, properties have uh, very familiar names: uh, the mean of the data set series, the variance, the frequency, the phase, the power, the autocorrelation. All of those things are constant through the whole data set. Okay, so of course, uh, and this is really the basis of of Claire uh, uh, first book, um, Fundamentals of Geophysical Data Processing, that came out in the late seventies, I think. Um, you know, with when you have uh, stationary data. Then you can do very simple analyses, and you can get uh, direct, uh, sometimes even closed form uh, solutions for uh, the problems that you have. Okay, uh, and and uh, uh, FDGC, FDGP, uh, that book uh, is still. I think that's the one book of Clairbout's that's still in print. Okay, it's proved so useful. And and you know people go to great lengths to extracting from their data sets, extracting parts that that are at least approximately stationary, because the the, the tools are so effective uh, on stationary data. The, all the tools that that book uh, has. Um, of course, what Clairbout really wanted to do 
was recognized that all real data are non-stationary and go beyond FGDP uh, to, um, um, to, to be able to work with uh, these more complex and more confusing data set, non-stationary data sets. Okay. Now, now, this is uh, some background here. Um, you know, Clairbout is assuming, and uh, uh, this is a pretty good guess for time series anyway. He's assuming that data properties, statistical properties, will not change quite as fast as the sample rate. And um, here we we run. Uh, headlong into uh, uh, some assumptions about the scale of, um, of variance in our, in, our, in our data. And especially when you're dealing with climate time series, um, uh, as um, uh, one of my colleagues at DRI pointed out uh, in a hydro um, and, and geology grad seminar um, a couple of months ago, um, uh, Rena Schumer is her name. Um, we, um, especially in climate, our data properties uh, change faster than our sample rates. All right. Now, um, uh, you know, word for the wise: um, if we go away from time and we deal with uh, from time series, we we deal with anything spatially. Um, you know, remote sensing images um, and uh, 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 say velocity models. Um, then uh, uh, I'm still betting that uh, all of these um, all of these uh, natural fields are fractal in nature, and thus they will always their prop their statistical properties will always vary faster than our sample rates especially our spatial sample rates. So, um, you know, what we can assume about time series, as Clairbout does here, just, just to get started, uh, and I think he's correct about, about seismograms in particular, um, but what we, uh, uh, what we assume about these uh, time series is, is not necessarily going to be so... Um, uh, so useful for um, uh, for spatial data series, and uh, so there's a little uh, a little warning there. Um, you know, I've done some work on the uh, fractal nature of uh, of um, uh, migrated uh, sections uh, um, and the uh, fractal nature of uh, velocity uh, measurements. Um, so. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, our, um, our data properties are changing faster than our spatial sample rates. Okay, um, so uh, and, and, and Rena showed uh, some interesting uh, problems that arise, uh, at least in, uh, in climatic studies, when you, when you attempt to do analyses that assume that uh, the statistics don't change as fast as the sampling. Uh, and when they do change uh, uh, much faster than the sampling, you, you can have horrible problems in estimating uh, whether changes in mechanism or, or uh, um, uh, whether there are deterministic changes going on. And she showed some very interesting examples of that. Um, so I recommend looking up uh, her papers uh, if, uh, if that sort of thing interests you. Um, and maybe uh, uh, you know, calling, up, calling her up and having a chat with her um, if you are running into any of the same sorts of observations. OK, so that aside, uh, you know, following Clairbout's path here now, making that assumption, um, what we can do then is we can analyze our data in small pieces, and we can assume that each piece is internally stationary. All right, and this is extremely useful. Okay, so uh, 
Let's take a, uh, uh, an example from seismology, earthquake seismology. So you have a, the amplitude on a, on a seismogram versus time increasing to the right. And um, you know, before you, you, your seismic events come in, you have some noise. Uh, then you, that's followed by the arrival of a P wave, and then uh, at some time later by an S wave, a direct or S body wave. Then maybe there will be some reflection. You know, here I, I added, given my my long term interests, I, I denoted it as the P wave reflection from the Moho PMP, and then a Rayleigh wave, uh, which I've also done more work on. And then later on, you know, and I've squeezed it in before the uh, the end of the time axis. There's uh, noise after the earthquake, or at least what appears to be noise, um, but it's uh, after the earthquake. So uh, let's look at uh, and for each of these uh, phases. You know, we'll we'll just chop out each phase independently on the seismogram. Let's look at its average amplitude, okay, or its mean. Uh, so a bar. Uh, let's look at the uh, amplitude variance. Uh, sigma squared of, of a, okay, and let's look at the frequency. Uh, maybe this is a uh, a bandwidth or a, a frequency distribution, a spectral type, um, or uh, uh, or maybe uh, just a peak frequency, okay. Uh, but some note about frequency. So the noise that comes in before is often uh, uh, the the uh, the average is is non-zero. It's biased, uh, usually because the uh, the seismometer element has has drifted, um, and I'm talking here about a displacement seismometer or a uh, or a uh, uh, ex acceler acceleration uh, ex accelerometer. Um, the uh, the variance is small. You know you can't see much on the on the trace, and its uh, spectrum is white. Okay. Um, or at least as white as, as you can analyze given the amount of, of noise data that you have. Then at the P wave arrival, the, uh, suddenly the average amplitude will be zero, right? This is a, a seismogram after all. Um, the, uh, the variance will be uh, medium in, in size, uh, and, the, um, and there'll be a high frequency bias to the, spec to the, spectral, uh, to the spectrum. Um, and then uh, uh, the S wave arrives, and it's uh, also uh, uh, got an average of zero. It's larger in in variance, and uh, uh, but not quite as high in frequency. The reflection comes in um, again. It's uh, got zero mean, medium variance, um, and uh, you know the sigma here. It's 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 the whole variance, even though this is all data here. So I, I'm not I'm not even adding noise to the uh, these could be very clean synthetic seismograms, okay. So it's just sigma squared. It's just a variance. Uh, the um, uh, you could talk about power as well or energy, uh, instantaneous energy, for instance, um, and the frequency is is again going to be high, and then uh, the Rayleigh wave comes in uh, and. Uh, it's so low frequency that it will have a biased average over your short window. It, it'll be very large in um, in its uh, um, um, in its variance and uh, uh, yeah, low frequency. Uh, now the noise that comes in after afterwards, you know, actually still contains a lot of uh, of. Uh, uh, of phases, we just can't recognize them. They're usually reflected off basin edges and that sort of thing. So it's not the same as the noise that comes before the event. Uh, so the uh, but again, the the average will be biased. The uh, the variance will be not small but medium in size, and the uh, the spectrum will not be low, uh, but it won't be high either. It'll be kind of uh, brownian noise. Um, so uh, uh, you know you could call it red noise if you want instead of white noise. Um, another example: a uh, shot record from seismic reflection. Okay, so uh, here we got a two D record, and we we can think about partitioning this off, you know, these different phases off um, 
you know, we've got many, many seismograms, right, all hanging down here from the x-axis. Um, we got, uh, uh, you know, both it, we could partition things off and window them off in, in x as well as t, right? So there's a direct wave d, uh, which is uh, got a uh, white frequency, and, a, and now we can, since we have 2d, we can characterize things by velocity as well. It's another statistical property, apparent velocity. I should have made that V A, right? No, I didn't want to get comp I didn't want to get uh, get confused with amplitude. Actually, you know, I should really show this to uh, uh, my um, my 492 class before they do their reflection lab because this uh, or their refraction lab because this always confuses them. Uh, you know, how do you identify? Uh, how do you tell a a reflection from a first from a uh, from a refraction? Um, and uh, this would help. Okay, so the uh, uh, the direct wave is powerful, so the variance is large. Okay, the refracted wave F uh, has uh, more medium frequency. Um, uh, you know, it's it's more uh, red red noise, and um, uh, or pink noise. <coughs> so it's and it's got a high velocity, and uh, it's medium in in its variance, its amplitude variance. Uh, this uh, shallow reflection here, R1, uh, it's also high frequency. It's uh, it's got a medium uh, medium high uh, uh, velocity. Okay. Um, no, I'm sorry. It's this reflection here. Yeah, right there. Right. It's got to have the same uh, velocity uh, as. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have uh, I should have made it uh, low velocity. Just well, it's medium because it, of course it does heal over, right? Uh, and it's because it's a hyperbola. Okay, so where you see it, it's usually uh, medium in uh, in velocity, and it's medium in in uh, in uh, variance. Uh, the multiple uh, here, so that's a multiply reflected refract refraction. So. Uh, uh, like the refraction, it's medium in, in its frequency content. It's uh, high in velocity and uh, and medium in its uh, uh, in its amplitude uh, variance. This deeper reflection R two, um, you know, it's lower frequency, more red noise uh, type of spectrum, and uh, uh, high, uh, very high in velocity, and it's got a very small um, uh, amplitude variance. The air wave is uh, is high frequency again. It's got the lowest velocity, uh, except in what uh, we were looking at. <laughs> There's uh, some very interesting uh, data uh, that that I've seen now from uh, you know l basically lake beds in uh, in northern Nevada, where the uh, um, the air wave is not the slowest phase. Amazingly enough. Um, and the airwave is, is often quite large in its uh, in its amplitude. Um, uh, let's consider something entirely non seismological, uh, a uh, like a Landsat image um, of uh, the Bay Area. So you've got the San Francisco Peninsula here, San, San Francisco Bay, um, and uh, uh, as you know, the uh, San Andreas Faults in there somewhere. Um, you got the ocean out here. You got uh, uh, Mountains, uh, uh, you know, Mount Diablo's over here somewhere, and then you got the plains of the Central Valley, um, and uh, you know maybe our our uh, the range of our data is uh, you know latitude and longitude. Okay, the uh, you know look at the ocean; it's got uh, a small amplitude variance. Uh, you know, it's dark. It's got uh, a small um, uh, frequency. Uh, uh, Bandwidth, you know this uh, um, this sigma squared of o omega, you know that's the frequency variance, uh, you know in both uh, latitude and longitude uh, frequency, and then uh, delta k is kind of uh, let's it probably sh it'd be better to call that lambda k, right? That's the um, the kind of bandwidth of uh, of the uh, um, the bandwidth of the of the spatial uh, of of the various slopes across this map, the various uh, azimuths across this map that you find, 
So, um, you know, the ocean uh, uh, really has uh, very few features in it. There may be some, some uh, swells and waves that you can see, uh, particularly if you're looking at something like a radar image or something close up like a, a Google Earth uh, image. Uh, fairly close up, you'll see the swells. But in any case, the, uh, you know, it's, it's basically, uh, there's, there's very few features. So delta K also is, is, lambda K is also small. The mountains, on the other hand, mostly uh, trend north-south, uh, so they have a large uh, delta K, all right? Um, and uh, uh, their, uh, their frequency, uh, um, their bandwidth is, is medium. You know, there's, there's little hills, there's big mountains. Um, and uh, also the amplitude variance is medium. You know, there's, uh, there's dark parts and light parts, uh, cities and, and uh, hills and, and forests. All that sort of thing. In the plains, it's all uh, agriculture with uh, roads and field boundaries at right angles. So um, yeah, you, they, they are very large in, in their reflectivity or their amplitude. Um, there's uh, large variations, you know, some bright fields, uh, recently irrigated dirt fields that are very dark. Um, but uh, everything is arranged in this nice uh, grid, so the, the bandwidth of K is uh, is small, you know. It's either uh, north south trending or it's east west trending. That's it. So in each case, uh, you know, our characterization implied that we had some criterion that we could use to break the data into pieces. All right, and and even even uh, you know that's that's how I you know named and and identified these various regions. Okay, now now. You might uh, you might be wondering, all right, if I'm just you know if I just slap this uh, Earth image into my uh, into my computer, you know, import it into MATLAB. I mean, MATLAB knows nothing about how to uh, interpret the ocean versus the mountains versus the plains. So, uh, you know, we need to classify it first. And uh, what we're going to do then is we're going to characterize these non-stationary data sets. By moving small windows over the data field, and accumulate the analyses in the data domain. Okay, so you know we might slap window one over the data right here, and then we'll move it down here. We'll make an analysis of of you know say all these properties. Um, then we'll move it over here, and and where do we you know every time we we slap this window down, you know we make a we make an analysis of. Uh, of, of various uh, statistical or spectral properties. So here's a, a sort of a schema for that. Okay, here's our data, right? And it's got, uh, say it's a, it's a shot gather. It's got the, so it's in the domain offset versus time, as a shot gather should be. And so we'll set up several different outputs. Okay, so this one input is gonna result in several outputs. This output here is of uh, frequency. Maybe it's the uh, peak frequency. This output here is of uh, velocity. You know, maybe the instantaneous velocity, um, or uh, what do they call that in Open Detect? Uh, it's the um, uh, you know you can compute it on a volume, and it and it uh, you know follows the apparent dip of all your arrivals in your in your data volume. Um, so it's some kind of computed dip volume. That's really what I'm talking about here, this velocity volume. Uh, and here's a, uh, here's a, uh, uh, a data field uh, that carries the uh, amplitude variance. Okay? So um, you know, we, uh, we center a window around one point here. And within that window, um, we, we analyze for these, uh, these you know, from the input data, we analyze for these various output fields, and we put the value we get right there in the middle, okay, in the same spot, you know, in the data space, but on these three separate uh, uh, pieces of data, okay. So uh, and, and also, you know, within each of these windows, we can do any kind of filtering or estimation that we want. We could have a very elaborate. Um, uh, inversion, you know, iterated inversion going on in here, and then we move the window, you know, one tick over, and we do it all again. Okay, 
and that's just to get the next point in our in our data field. So the example that uh, uh, that uh, Clairbout starts with, I'm sure, is the uh, you know was the the genesis of of this uh, uh, dip volume or whatever they call it in uh, uh, you know that of course Open Detect uses that and and all uh, sizing processing systems uh, uh, calculate this. Um, so uh, Clairbot calls it dip picking, all right. And uh, here our example is uh, uh, maybe a uh, shot gather, maybe it's a uh, maybe it's a, a seismic section uh, like a stack or a migration. And uh, we're going to try to we're going to try to interpret the dip of our um, uh, of of the reflections that we see in that seismic section. Okay, so we have x versus t. And uh, of course, uh, as you remember from uh, uh, talking about the slant stack, um, uh, we can write an equation for a, a constant dip. You know that we could pick out across this uh, um, across this section, and uh, it would be uh, you know looking at all these times t that are equal to our intercept time tau, okay, on the t-axis. Plus the uh, slowness p times the distance x. Okay, t is equal to tau plus p x. So that would be, uh, um, you know, how the slant stack thinks about the uh, the dip in terms of this slowness p. Um, so we have a recorded seismic reflection wave field u of t and x. So we're we're talking about a two D uh, stack here, really, uh, or or a two D uh, migration section. So a plane wave appears as a straight line, and that straight line is connecting points of equal phase. If there really is a plane wave there, all right. So the apparent velocity uh, v sub a is one over the ray parameter p. Uh, the slope is p, right? That's dt dx. Um, the the true velocity, right? Remember, uh, if, if this is a uh, a uh, a stack section uh, in a time section. The true velocity v is going to be less than or equal to the apparent velocity, the absolute value of the apparent velocity. Actually, apparent velocity will allow to go negative, but we know that uh, true rock velocity does not. Um, the propagation angle, right? Uh, we we go between uh, 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 the uh, ray parameter and the true velocity by knowing the propagation angle, the sine of theta, um, is equal to p v. So uh, uh, yeah, in, in an inaccurate analogy with a, with a migrated section or a real cross a geologic cross section, the plane wave slope is called a dip. So you know, and, and of course, as it's implemented in open detect, you know that's only you know you only interpret uh, migrated uh, depth migrated sections anymore, um, and uh, uh, so it is a dip, uh, but. Uh, you know, when we're looking at uh, a time section, it's really just a, a slope. It's really just an apparent velocity. Uh, so to estimate a dip within a window, let's write an objective function that goes to zero when we have finally found the best value of the ray parameter p. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna be uh, finding p, and here's an objective function. Okay. So, uh, uh, so well, we haven't written the objective function yet. Sorry. Let's begin with uh, the velocity is equal to the uh, you know we have our data field uh, u that's our our uh, time section, and uh, we have um, uh, we're applying this operator a right. So the velocity is equal to um, uh, uh, d dx plus p sub i. Times ddt, okay. So we're applying an x derivative and a, uh, and we're adding to that a uh, uh, p times a, a slowness times a time derivative, okay. And um, if the if the p uh, sub i is correct, okay. If we have the correct p sub i, uh, you know, and we've calculated these derivatives across the data field. And the p is following a uh, 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 um, a constant phase, then um, this velocity, this v output, 
it's not velocity, I'm sorry, this v output will go to zero. And the meaning of v here is, is residual, okay, not velocity. So the, um, this is a plane wave destroyer. Okay, and uh, when it's minimized, when it when it's minimized, that means we had the right p. Our p sub i is correct. Okay, so we've discretized uh, our time section u, and we've aligned it to a discretized section of of the residual v. So the residual v also is is a time section. It's got axes x and t. And so here's our uh, discret uh, or a piece of our discretized uh, time section. We got, uh, you know, we're located here at u of at t and x, and of course uh, going back in time one uh, time sample. That's the time t minus delta t, and of course forward one time sample t plus delta t. Of course delta t and and delta x in this are uh, are constant. Uh, that's that's a simplification that that. Uh, uh, you know, Claire about and I will will make all the time without telling you. Um, and uh, likewise, uh, uh, in this uh, in this output uh, residual field V, uh, you know, here here's the value of V uh, that we can plop in there. You know, from that uh, by by making this this derivative computation here. Um, at x and t, and then of course, uh, if we move uh, over in x one, we're at x plus delta x. If we move down in time one one sample, we're at x plus delta t. Um, now we don't in this case, uh, you know, obviously delta x is not going to be necessarily equal to delta t. Although Clairbout will probably uh, pay play a lot of the same tricks in in dropping delta t and delta x out of his equations, and you'll have to. Put them back in if you actually were to implement this. Um, all right. So on a discretized grid, uh, you know, think back to seven hundred six. How do we estimate the derivatives, the partial derivatives, d dx of u and d dt of u? You know, du dt and du dx. How do we implement? How do we estimate those on a discretized grid? Well, of course, we use a finite difference approximation of the derivative. And uh, you know, so just to review that, uh, we recall the definition of a derivative. du dt, for instance, is equal to the limit as delta t goes to zero of u at t plus delta t and at x minus u at t and x divided by that whole uh, that that uh, difference divided by delta t. And we just allow delta t to remain finite, so we could approximate uh, du dt. <coughs> With uh, u at t plus delta t and x minus u at t and x divided by delta t, and of course du dx is uh, u at t and uh, x plus delta x minus u at t and x divided by delta x. Now, um, so our both of our estimates um, du d of du dt right. We're using when we get du dt, we're using these two. Uh, these two samples here of the of the u, so our estimate is simp is uh, you know we're saying uh, this one minus that one, and then divide by uh, delta t, and so really because our our uh, because our our uh, uh, estimate uses these two and no others, okay, and uses them equally. Our uh, our estimate for the derivative is centered on the line between them, you know, at t plus uh, uh, delta t over two. Okay. Uh, likewise, the x derivative uses these two. Okay, and uh, uh, and that estimate is centered at at t, not t plus half, centered at t uh, and x plus delta x. Okay. So the two estimates are are not centered in the same place. So uh, uh, and and we saw in seven oh six how useful it can be to uh, uh, you know to fix up our 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 uh, finite difference uh, finite dis difference uh, estimates by uh, uh, using uh, this uh, centering centering strategy. So we can center uh, every all the estimates in the same spot by averaging two estimates in each direction. 
And this adds a lot of robustness, actually, because uh, you know we're just instead of only using two points to estimate, uh, say, delta uh, uh, ddx, we're using four pieces of the data. So if there's a spike, you know, in one of them, uh, it won't affect. You know, it, it, its its effect is is going to be slightly mitigated. Okay, so uh, you know, du dt is going to be the average one over two times one over delta t of of u at t plus delta t at x minus u at t and x, and then also one half over one over uh, two delta t of u at t plus delta t and x plus and at x plus delta x minus u at t and x plus delta x, and and a very similar thing for the uh, uh, for the uh, x derivative, so then uh, you know both of the uh, uh, both of the derivatives now use all four of these samples to get an estimate, uh, you know, of the uh, of the derivative, and uh, and it's centered at uh, uh, t plus uh, uh, half delta t and x plus half delta x. So. Uh, uh, but now we know also that the operator, this operator d d x plus uh, p sub i uh, times uh, d d t, it's a two-dimensional filter, and it's a convolution, you know, getting the uh, uh, differencing star. Okay, uh, it's the convolution by the following two-dimensional series. So for the residual v, okay, which is what we're going to try to minimize to determine, you know, for the univariate estimation problem of determining the slope p, right? Um, here's the coefficient applied to each of the four elements uh, when we do those when we implement this operator, okay? And uh, you can see it's uh, it's uh, pretty symmetric, um, not quite symmetric. Uh, each all these four elements are different, okay? And these are the so that's the the coefficients of the differencing star there. So guessing a uh, um, you know guessing a, a p sub i completely determines all the values in this filter, right? We know what delta x is, we know what delta t is, um, and uh, and so as soon as we come up with a guess for p sub i, then we we can find v uh, no problem. So within each two by two application of the moving window, we estimate the single variable. Pi, okay, um, and then we uh, we can plot uh, p sub i uh, versus x and t in the data domain. Okay, remember that was u, right? U is uh, is a is a time section. It's got x across the top and t going down. Okay, and uh, you know we have this uh, this uh, uh, differencing star that we're moving around, and then we're Plotting the result uh, in in the in the data field, but it's not u that we're that we're throwing in there. It's the values of v, right? The residual. Okay. So um, uh, and we can do that everywhere. So uh, we can let x uh, uh, we can have a, an x direction um, operator uh, equal to du uh, at uh, t and x uh, uh, dx. And we have a t direction operator that's uh, du uh, at t and x dt, okay, and and all of these, uh, you know, the u vector, the x vector, the t vector, those are abstract data vectors which are two D data structures. So uh, uh, that's just a little a little setup, uh, you know, notational setup, so we can write the uh, objective function now. We can estimate p by minimizing the, this quadratic objective function, okay, um, which is uh, you know basically v v squared, right? This is uh, v and this is v, so we got v v times v. Um, so we're going to set up a q, and what we're going to invert for is p, all right, and uh, we have uh, x plus p t squared basically, all right, and um, uh, now we need to differentiate uh, q with respect to p to find the best the best value of p, right? So that's two times uh, 
uh, uh, x dot t. These are two, you know, all of these vectors uh, uh, are in the the data domain, right? Um, just x here is is this derivative uh, applied to u, and t is is a derivative applied to u. All right, and um, so it's just notation there. Uh, so these, you know, these are the same, uh, uh, you know, same size, uh, same dimensionality of, of data vectors. Uh, you know, the x vector dot the t vector plus uh, p times uh, the uh, uh, the t vector dotted with itself. Okay, so we set it to zero, and we get uh, then we can just algebraically solve p here is equal to um, minus uh, x dot t, okay, divided by t dot t. Right. So at any application of the window, you know this is going to give us the the best value of uh, of p um, that gets us that uh, um, that vector uh, that gets us the uh, the apparent velocity p or the apparent slowness p. The size of the moving window we use affects uh, uh, the sizes of, of x and t. Um, you know, we could set the sizes to uh, uh, to one to estimate a, a p sub i at every point, okay, of of u, right? Uh, except at the very far edges where we got to do something different. Uh, you know, set a boundary condition of some kind. Um, or just to, or just not calculate it at the edges. Um, you know the way we're doing this, right? The uh, uh, we de we determine we make the calculation of the slope here, but it, really it's centered over here, so it needs these elements at a, at larger x and larger t. Okay, so uh, 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 we might have to leave off uh, the calculation for uh, 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 you know at the edges. Um, and uh, uh, you know, p at t and x is going to be equal to minus then uh, du dx times du dt uh, divided by du dt squared. And uh, each derivative is estimated by the finite difference filter. Okay. Now, uh, uh, how do we get a handle on the quality of our p estimates? Um, you know whether we're we're calculating at every point or maybe only every every ten points. Let's evaluate a residual uh, v as well at every t. Okay, so we have the equation to do that. We can we can compute that residual no problem, um, and uh, we can also uh, examine the quality by using a normalized correlation. All right, so that would be. Uh, uh, x dot t divided by the geometric mean, the square root of the quantity uh, x dot x times t dot t. Okay, that will also uh, get us a, a, a measure of, of quality, as will the residual. Uh, we can calculate this residual v at every point of t and x. Um, if our moving windows are so small that x and t have only one point each, um, then um, then our our uh, our residual our, our normalized correlation is always going to be either one or minus one, right? So uh, you know if you're using larger moving windows, and I'm sure this is what's done with um, uh, by Open Detect and every other seismic uh, interpretation program. Um, you can choose. Ah, okay. You choose the uh, the window width. You can change it vertically and horizontally. Yeah. Bias. Yeah, yeah, you can make it. You can you can expand the windows as you move down, for instance. No, um, no I mean the your window doesn't have to be square. Oh yeah, like yeah. You can just do the vertical, and then you get a vertical derivative. Right, right. Yeah, probably uh, uh, you know a, a an expensive commercial program like Kingdom allows you to even uh, uh, when you set up your dip calculation, you can even uh, um, expand windows. Uh, and contract them as you move to different parts of the uh, uh, different parts of the of the data. I mean that would make sense, right? Um, yeah. Because the the uh, you know the 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 sections certainly change wavelength as you move uh, 
uh, you know, from the top to the bottom. Um, right. So um, you know, you can. Uh, I mean, this this bias in the correlation. You know, if you use a window too small, I mean, will OpenDetect allow you to use a uh, a window that's only one um, one by one? I don't know anything about OpenDetect. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, um, you know that would not be a very good uh, strategy. So you use a broader window to minimize the uh, the bias. All right. So here is a summary of the univariate estimation process, which is, you know, this whole thing really has been developed as a kind of a teach-in and a setup for um, for multivariate estimation. But we've we've you know got some useful results there. You know, in deconvolution and in uh, dip estimation. Um, Let's express. So the first thing you do is you express the operation of generating data from the model. Okay, you got to figure out how to model, and like for Kyle, that rep that uh, led to an SEG paper and talk. So uh, you know, step one is 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 a very good thing to do. Uh, you express then number step two, a conjugate operation to estimate a model from the data. Which here is in terms of a single variable, okay? So uh, uh, you know, in what we just did, you know, there's the conjugate operation there, getting uh, getting the p model from the data. And not for say the linear travel times. That's that would be the direct matrix inversion. In this kind of uh, no, no. It's the conjugate operation is not the inverse. And we're going to talk more about that. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the difference, the similarity, and the differences between the inverse and the conjugate. Okay. So, so the conjugate, uh, in, in terms of travel time tomography, the conjugate is the back projection, right? Mm -hmm. And and in um, in uh, uh, deconvolution, uh, I'll go way up here. Um, Okay. In deconvolution, the inverse is this is spectral division right here, and the conjugate is match filtering, cross correlation. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna be looking at those uh, those differences a lot. Um. So, uh, you know, we've we've talked about uh uh. You know univariate uh, conjugation, but uh, we're already familiar with a number of uh, of um, of operations uh, and their their inverses and their conjugates. And uh, let me give you a spoiler spoiler alert. Um, uh, one reason why we are so overly fond of the of the Fourier transform is that its conjugate. Is its is its perfect accurate inverse. That is a such a beautiful property of the uh, of the Fourier transform. Uh, I still find it mind boggling, um, but so it makes it obvious as to why we we are, you know, all through seven oh six, you know, the Fourier transform was coming back and coming back and coming back, um, and that's why. Okay, then you write an objective function. That is minimum for some desirable condition, and and we talked about the pitfalls of of writing that object, objective function. You know, maybe minimizing the variance uh, or minimizing the power uh, to prevent the solution from blowing up. Okay, then find the value of the single vari a, a variable at the minimum of the objective function. Okay, and for sing for uh, univariate estimation, we could do that in closed form, right? Write a, a an incredibly simple uh, equation here, um, you know that gets us the uh, the the quantity we want, you know by by doing uh, by dividing uh, one uh, scalar by another. Incredibly simple. Okay. Uh, then we use that value to estimate a model, and we estimate then with that model we estimate a Somehow we estimate a residual or an error, and then we go back. We loop back to step four, and we iterate if we need to, 
weighting by the residual, okay, and and you know finding another value of the of that single variable um, that hopefully is closer to the minimum of the, of the objective function, and then uh, we we uh, uh, so after looping through there until we're tired of it, uh, then we gotta we gotta move our window, and uh, sorry oh there we go we gotta move our window and we've got to um, start again from step four. So uh, you know, there's uh, window movement is this outer is this outer loop, and iteration you know of the solution within each window is this uh, inner loop. And that's the that's the outline of the process, and this will work for multivariate estimation as well. And uh, time to stop.